Hello and welcome again to another episode of our original podcast. Two guys discussing software. Two, two Irish guys. Yes, thank you. Two Irish guys discussing software. My name is Tomás O'Leary. I'm joined here by my esteemed corrector and friend and colleague, Brendan Walsh. Hello, Brendan. Hello and good morning. Come on, so how are you today? Yes, it's a nice sunny day here in Ireland. No matter where you're listening to us, the sun is shining here on the Emerald Isle and we're here to discuss our usual range of topics where we discuss everything from obviously our favorite topic, third party support for software, IBM renewals, cost savings, client experience and how to deal with your IBM contracts and renewals. But as always, we like to start with some news. What have we seen in the market? Not just about IBM, um, although we will obviously talk about IBM naturally. We like to talk about th- things that are in news, but we, we might just mention that we will have a very special guest with us later on in a few minutes. We'll have Rory Canavan from Sam Charter will join us. And we're going to talk a little bit about one of the topics that we talked about the last time, which was the uh, HCL acquisition of, of IBM, some of IBM's more strategic products that they sold on for $2 billion. But we'll come back to that in a moment. I, I did notice a little bit of news, Brendan. I don't know if you saw it. IBM uh, and Oracle letting people go. This is a shameful thing to be doing. They're letting people go. And actually, in, in the United States, according to the layoff.com, they are being sued. Second law case in the United States against IBM for targeting people who are in their year at age we're very close to mm. in their fifties. Mm. All right, so this is this is not something we're very happy with. Uh, thankfully, people are taking action about it and they're doing something about it. They're not taking it lying down. So yes, there's apparently there's been a a targeted uh, campaign by IBM to remove anyone over fifty within their organization. Um, I'm not sure if Ginny Romity or any of the board fall into that category, <laughs> but it looks like uh, they may be exempt from that. But that's and also I see. Oracle are doing something similar, except it's less public. And I think it's probably fair to say that IBM are too, they're usually a little bit more transparent than Oracle. Oracle doing it in a very subtle way. It hasn't come and it really hit the news yet, but um, letting go people in Redwood, uh, apparently they dragged the whole of the guys in, mm-hmm. uh, girls, and they told them, we don't need you anymore. There'll be people that wait to get outside to meet you and you'll be packing your things and you'll be sent out. So everybody with 25, 30 years of experience in their chosen subject, Probably core legacy products of IBM are being let go. Great. And it's brilliant for yeah, us. Yeah. It's brilliant for us. Not great for them, to be fair, their families, which is not a good thing. But to be honest with you, this is what's happening increasingly in the market. And the good news for us, as you know, this is the business model we have is to help these people get them back in the workforce and get them back on mm. working with customers. But well, that's what our clients want. They're looking for people with 20 years experience yeah. in, in the particular product. So Yeah, but isn't it shameful that the customers of IBM and the customers of Oracle actually still want service. Mm. And yet what's happening is they're ignoring their customer requirements. They're getting rid of the skilled people, almost saying, right, okay, we don't need these people. Well, they actually do, but we don't want them anymore because the future is the cloud or the future is cybersecurity or the future is whatever the, the future is, AI. They're insisting that these people, even though potentially some of these very experienced people could well be reskilled. It's not happening. Yeah. Well, they just spent 30 billion buying Red Hat, so they probably need some cash. Correct. So one way to get cash is to reduce your salary count, which is probably the highest cost in your business. So, yeah, you know, I know that sounds clandestine or whatever, but, uh, but that's possibly what they're up to, you know? Okay. Yeah. I mean, speaking of Red Hat, actually, I don't know if you noticed, they did double digit growth again mm-hmm. the last quarter. I wonder will that continue when they get acquired by IBM? And um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Even that deal finally goes through later in the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, other news I spot, picked up on, I, and I don't know whether you saw this one as well. We talked about this one of our last podcast, the Oracle and Google case. Apparently, Oracle have come back to the Supreme Court and said, mm. no, no, don't listen. There's nothing to be heard. <laughs> don't look. <laughs> I'm not sure how the Supreme Court really worked that way, but apparently that's the news. They said they... Don't listen to what Google are telling you. They're trying to get the, the Supreme Court not to listen to Google's appeal. And one of the bit of news I saw actually is really interesting about money. I saw mm. poor Bill McDermott from SAP CEO. His salary was half in 2018 what it was in 2017. Can you believe that? Well, actually, it was more than halved from 20 odd, $24 million to $11 million. So, oh yeah. my God. So, What's he going to do? Shout out to Bill. Sorry, to Bill. One, one yeah. less holiday then. Yeah. Yeah. So that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> um, but to be fair, he's probably paid pittance compared to some of the other CEOs, but uh, in the big corpse. So other things that were worth mentioning to our listeners? 
not a huge amount, to be honest. I've been so busy here, but no, I mean, some of the things that are topical in terms of kind of right to repair, I think you're going to talk about that shortly. It seems to be, you know, when we talk to, to clients in the market, there still seems to be, I guess, a lack of awareness of, you know, the right to repair, third party support. See Elizabeth Warren in the US is shouting out about farmers' rights to repair equipment. Why shouldn't they have the rights to do that? So it's part of her kind of manifesto. So it's, it's a growing topical thing and it's, uh, it's interesting that it's been picked up date side. But uh, in conversations as I have kind of on a weekly basis with our clients, you know, what's interesting that, that I find is that there's still, you know, a lack of awareness of their rights, you know, yeah. and that analogy of, well, just because you have a Volkswagen doesn't mean you have to go back to the Volkswagen dealership to get it fixed. Yeah. That that kind of that analogy applies to software. So, uh, so I've kind of spent too much time on the front line the last number of weeks to have too many interesting stories, but the, but the front line itself is interesting in terms of what people are, what they think. Great, yeah, and you probably saw the news, which is fantastic news here in Europe on that very topic. The Eco Design Directive has been passed and is now law. And what the Eco Design Directive effectively insists owners of technology data center assets to be able to get access to firmware and get access to security patches, which is really, really good news. Now, it got a little bit lost in the whole Article 13 of the Copyright Act. There's a lot of pros and cons of that. I'm not going to, I think that's probably a topic for that's another topic. another <laughs> podcast. You might get one of our lawyers on that particular yeah. one to see how it impacts the, the, the software industry. But ultimately what we have is fantastic news out of Europe. For the first time now we have a law that enshrines the rights of owners of assets that they can actually get them fixed and that the technology manufacturers and the software publishers have to provide the actual fixes and updates. Now it does cover only a category of assets currently, but this is where the, the, the whole market's going. And also only this week as well, they published a, a joint research uh, committee or council report around serviceability of technology. New standard they're proposing around, in the same way you have an um, energy efficiency label on your dishwasher or your kettle or your computer um, or indeed your piece of equipment in your data center, you will now, if this proposal goes to law, which is where the Eco Design Directive started a number of years ago, because we know I was involved as part of the free ICT Europe on that journey, we know that they will ultimately, this will be, if this becomes law, that it will actually have a label on technology assets and all uh, tech IT assets that will rate its ability to be serviced, which I think wow. is really, really important. It's seriously significant. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, you know, I think that ultimately what we're dealing with here is a whole change in the marketplace. Mm. I think we're, we're dealing with a change and we're dealing with you know, an environment where they're for, particularly for mature assets, where we've got mature assets, you've got to be able to understand what can I do with them? Now, speaking of mature assets, mm. uh, and somebody who understands maturity and, and in the software asset management world very, very well, um, I'd like to welcome Rory. How are you? I'm fantastic, Rory. I'm fantastic. We're having conversations with you about a number of things. We love the work that you do around fixing SAM problems and your love of structure, your love of maturity. I, will, I do want to talk to you. I mean, I'll get you a chance to maybe give your own thoughts on some of the things we spoke about, but I'd love to talk to you about the topic of the IBM HCL and particularly around Big Fix and ILMT. I think that's an important thing to talk about. But you know, some of the news we've been talking about, any, any of that uh, pique your interest? So um, just in, in preparation for this call, one of the things that perhaps caught my eye is that there, there are several companies now who are in the insurance game who are actually going to be looking to assess software for its suitability and, and worthiness in respect of cybersecurity. By extension, you're then going to have to start looking at versions and additions and patching information, which just plays right back in, into the SAM fold there. So that, that really caught my eye because it looks like it's more than just one or two companies are going to do this. It looks like like it's going to be a quite a wide initiative. There's going to be uh, there are several insurance companies, you know, large insurance companies that are actually looking to do this. So it sounds like it's a bit like that label um, uh, we were just talking about there, that the serviceability label. It's like an insurability rating you're talking about. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly that, but rather than actually 
looking at the, the repairability and the sustainability of the hardware. You're looking at the worthiness of the software for actually doing the job that it, it's installed for. That's, that's going to be a bellwether, I think, for the insurance companies to say, right, hey, if you're turning your attention towards financial institutions who are looking after personal data, have you got the right software in place to be able to protect that personal data? Now, I know there's, there's been initiatives like this before, but a lot of them have been voluntary. The thing that's piqued my interest with this is that if the insurance companies are doing it, they're, giving, they're going to be giving a rating. If they're not going to be giving a rating, then they're going to be pay or charging those companies the higher insurance premium to do business as well. So hopefully it'll be in companies' commercial interests to manage their software properly then. About. Yeah. I wonder would it cover something like that happened with Boeing? The fact that they, 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 they it looks like it's a software glitch that caused a problem with those two airplanes going down. It, it, oh, that's, that's an interesting one because from, from my point of view, you, I would say I'd be looking to the FAA to say, you're, you're the guy, you're the authority on this. You're the ones who should be, you gave the certificate of airworthiness for that plane. You're the ones who should have been assessing the suitability of, uh, of that software. You know, whether it's the insurance company or whether it's the FAA, obviously somebody needs to, to grasp that nettle and make sure that, uh, you know, the planes don't tip themselves into the ground anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's really showing a, a focus on, on software more than there ever was before. In general, because, because you look at it, software's on everything now. I mean, you know, you've got to have rules and regulations. You can't let it. It's, I think up until, you know, recently, it, it really has been the Wild West. Would you not agree with that? I mean, it's been a Wild West of of rules and regulations and equality and people can pretty much do what they want we know this in the whole you know measurement area if they can measure any way they want they can charge whatever they like we're going to have we'll touch about it in a few minutes that you know hcl are going to buy a bunch of products from ibm none of the companies we talk about have any idea what's going to happen uh, end of June or end of July, whenever the the, the deal finally closes. Um, so it's you know even find that customers that we have are being approached by IBM to do multi year deals for software that they know and IBM knows is not going to be they're not going to own uh, in in a few months time. What does it mean for that software? How is that software going to be developed going forward? What will HCL do? They're being silent on it, or at least from what we can tell, and their customers need to know. I mean. And all of this thing is interconnected in, in, in slightly different ways. I mean, you're talking about rating something, we're talking about repairing something, but ultimately what we want is we need, it's clarity, it's confidence. And the software industry is, should, be, should be doing more really, shouldn't it? I, I think so. I think what's, what should be really interesting actually is if, if IBM you know, grabbed a few clients and said, right, raise, raise some dummy calls, you know, make some use cases for a big fixed problem that you have. And we'll work it through the system to the point where actually we're not providing the technical support anymore. We're going to hand over to HCL. So that if there are any air gaps, those air gaps are closed off as soon as humanly possible then at that point. So you have got a, a continuity of service. But yeah, that's, um, it's, that's one of those things that's got to be teased out. It makes, it makes me think, so actually, if HCL has bought this, there's, there's got to be some legs in the program. There's got to be some life in the product set. Because I can't imagine IBM making the sale and then thinking two years later, actually, do you know what? We're going to spring up an, a new product. I think this is a problem that's, that's, that needs to be resolved. It's not going to go away any time soon. Yeah, it's, it's certainly very convoluted. I've been reading, obviously, a bit about this. It comes up in daily conversations. Some of the angles that I've been looking at are coming from the licensing side of things. So, you know, the seven products and this comes falls into your space, you know, Rory, more than mine, obviously, in, in terms of how clients actually deal with this and the complexities of it. So, but let's say you've got seven products, you know, they've been sold to, to HCL. You're using some of those. Some of those are using subcapacity. Some of those are, are you're, you know, you're remaining compliant because you've got Big Fix inventory deployed. Big Fix is now sold to HCL. Obviously, the journey only starts with understanding what you've deployed you've got to compare that against your entitlement within PA but your entitlements won't be in PA anymore they're going to have to be in some other software provided by HCL you know how do you determine across you know I suppose now two companies whether you're compliant whose audit are you going to be subjected to is HCL now going to be auditing you as well as IBM are you going to be using a HCL product to monitor 
both IBM products, that product being Big Fix, and non-IBM products? Will you have to separately deploy ILMT? Uh, I don't know. I was trying to. I was going to do a diagram earlier, put into a some kind of you know rollup cube to try and figure out you know what the what the different parameters are. And I don't think anybody knows. I think that's the problem. It's it's very confusing, and I don't think anybody's probably thought it through. But there's some interesting articles out there. Obviously, some people are thinking about it, but I think the customers are going to be in a bit in a state of shock. Yeah, I, th- I think it potentially it's going to be one of those suck it and see scenarios. I suspect what will happen is a lot of the the newly owned HCL software will be considered uh, OEM or embedded. So you still, if you if you do sort of pay any any dues to anybody, because I know some of the software is is free, you'll still go through the the IBM protocol, as it were. But it's you, you do have to tip your hat in the direction of of HCL as far as uh, vendor management is concerned. So I would be all eyes and ears to say uh, to hear out from uh, HCL as to um, how they want to proceed with things moving forward. Can I ask you a question, Rory? In the past, uh, have scenarios like for other vendors where they've sold portions of their portfolio um, like this, this is going to be a significant portion. I mean, I'm not sure how many thousands of customers there are out there, but there must be several thousand to spend two billion on on aging products. What typically happens, or is there a is there a history of this, or is this very new? Um, I, I think I think there is an undercover history because if you look at how um, how aggressive Oracle's M and A activity is, you can you can see organisations have been there before. I mean, even Microsoft too. They bought Internet Explorer. They bought Visio. Um, they didn't craft those products themselves. They just brought them into the family. Then at that point, so it's it's one of those things to understand what the M and A life cycle of those software vendors is, and and to and to tune into that. Then at that point, I. I, I don't know how previous HCL acquisitions have taken place, but to, to to just return to the point previously I made, embedded or OEM software is not something new in the in the SAM world. You'll get um, instances of, say, crystal reports or even databases that are embedded in bigger and wider applications, but they're sold as part of the licensing agreement for the bigger and wider applicational system. So it's it's not new, but it's change and. Unfortunately, in Sam, change is the enemy. So you just have to you just have to stay ahead of it. Yeah, you don't normally see though a lo- a large company offloading its software to a smaller player. I mean, I mean, HCL are a big company, but in comparison to IBM, they're a smaller player. So usually, it's the other way around. It's the big company acquiring the software. Um, in fact, usually the entire company. It's just unusual. The assets are going to how they're going to unwind that. I'd say I'd say it's not going to be easy. And that's going to be easy. Any other thoughts on it, Rory? It, it's interesting that you you meant you you opened the, the podcast talking about um, laying off of personnel with twenty five and thirty years of experience. But obviously, there there isn't a sort of a training program in place to, uh, to to maintain that knowledge base to to maintain the support. So you know why not. You know, farm out to a smaller institution that perhaps, you know, smaller is relative because you know practically every organisation is smaller than IBM. It's um, it, it's playing to the knowledge base. It's understanding where the, where the technical support and the knowledge is and who we can actually pass out the support to. So, so I'm, what's the point I'm actually trying to make here at this point? It's if you do want to extend the life of these products, that's the that's arguably the way to do it is to pass it to an organisation that has that knowledge base. Now. That's a that's a judgment call on part of IBM because, like you say, if they're firing people, they could have they could have retained those staff and retrained them. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you're, you're, what you're telling me is it sounds really good news for our sales team. <laughs> These people should be coming to us, is what you're telling them. <laughs> that too. Yes, yes. The very next sentence on my lips there. Yeah, yeah. For sure, sure. Yeah. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have to be HCL. It can be, um, you know, the independents and and the other c- companies out there who can, um, arguably do it at a you know. Equal, if not better quality, and for for I I don't know, guys. I'm sure a very reasonable price too. Excellent. Well, we lo- we love that that little sales pitch there. What are you up to yourself these days? And and before we, we wrap up, are you uh, anything you want to tell our, our listeners and tell us what what's been happening in your in your life? So so what I've done recently is um, I I have a a measure or a maturity assessment on on the website on the Sam Charter website, and it's it's a giveaway really it's a 20 question assessment of of where you stand with your sam maturity so what i've done is um and, and through other partners as well that i have i've taken the findings of uh, people who've taken and completed that assessment anonymized it uh, and produced a a global 
maturity report for software asset management. And that's now up and live on um, our, uh, our white papers page, which you can download for free as well. So I think between the two, you've got a, you know, a 20 minute exercise to see where you are with Sam and then to compare where you are with other organizations around the world. That's, you know, in the world of IT, that would be compelling reading. So uh, uh, that's me. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, best of luck with that, Rory. Um, great to have you on the show. Um, we're, we're going to have to say goodbye uh, and goodbye to you, Brendan, and goodbye to me and goodbye to everybody else. And we will hopefully talk to everybody very soon. All right. Thanks, Rory. It's two guys discussing software. <laughs>